So we're talking about in this session the phrase that is in the sixth chapter of the Gita, the fifth verse. You are your own best friend, you are your own worst enemy. Actually it says you can be, not you are, you can be your own best friend and you can be your own worst enemy. It's a lot to do with how one thinks about oneself. Just to give you a little background of the Gita, it is set in a larger epic called the Mahabharat. And the Mahabharat is the Great World War. And it is set in India and it is a great war between two ruling families which resulted, strangely enough, in the losers, the bad guys, going to heaven and the winners, the good guys, going to hell. And nobody can figure out that bit. But you can see how very much opposite to conventional morality the message of the Gita is, even though it is often quoted as the foundation of morality, but nevertheless it's really going another way. The, the Gita is a conversation between Arjuna and Krishna, and Arjuna is the great warrior who finds himself in civil war because the two families are actually cousins and so he refuses to fight on the grounds that it is not moral to uh, attempt to destroy your family members. And Krishna says to him, what you have to do is to destroy evil and evil is sitting within some of your family members and because of that you're not destroying them, you're destroying it. So it's a question of what do you see? Do you see the family member or do you see the evil that is in the family member? He could occasionally see the evil but then he would immediately then see the family member and then he stopped being able to see the evil. Within one's own self, your relationship with yourself has very much to do with your ego. And the ego is a kind of imposter because it, it lets you know in different ways, I am you. And then um, truth would say, no, that is false, that is, that is not you. That is a substitute for you which was created through delusion. And see the real you. So there is this enormous difference between who you really are at your core and who you have been raised to be. And so we are very much um, affected by how we're raised. Our sense of identity is given to us by our parents and we have a national, cultural, religious, ethnic, all of this identity and that's all put into us through our education and we're taught your life track will be like this, like this, like this because this is your family, this is your caste, this is your class, this is who you are and you will do this and this and this and this and that will be you. And some people go along the track that is prescribed for themselves and all of a sudden they say, you know what, self, that's not me. 
Have you ever felt something like that? This track that was laid out for me, that's not me. So very often a person will just kind of go off into the woods or go into silence or go away on a long journey or sit in a sailing boat and cross the Atlantic or the Pacific or somewhere uh, trying to find the self. And this, um, this book, the Gita, is all about that. And it really ends up as the difference between what the outside world makes you think you are and that too due to your interpretation of the world through sense perception and then what the divine tells you you are. And the voice of the divine is very small, very subtle, very difficult to hear. If you do get to hear it, it puts you in tremendous conflict because it is so different from the voice of the world. And it's not to say that the voice of the world is bad, but the voice of the world leads you to um, loss of self and therefore it is not recommended so it's really all about doing for the self what enhances the self and one of the expressions that we hear through what I call toxic conventional morality is don't be selfish have you heard that? And it's very often directed to women who say, I am inspired to be a composer of music. And it will be said, there are no female composers. Actually there are, but they get deleted from the history books to prove that there aren't any, to prove that we better keep it like that. And after the Second World War, as far as I know, there were 67 million men killed. That's a lot. Who had to put the world back together again was basically the women. Who found that I can actually manipulate a screwdriver and I can actually organize a community and uh, set up schools and handle property and finances and, 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 and. Also, just before the Second World War um, was a time when there was really huge awakening within people. So on one hand there was this great awakening and on the other hand, there was this devastating destruction. And the Gita is also a period, uh, in a period of time of great awakening and devastating destruction. Um, and the Great World War uh, is probably not the Second World War, but perhaps a Third World War, because that would be the end of that. Here we are facing this this identity crisis and you know that these movements of existentialism and all that they were happening at this time Alcoholics Anonymous came into being at this time um, many many things were happening where people were kind of waking up uh, and asking themselves the question what am I? and really thinking about this um, a kind of androgyny. Uh, the symbol of perfection in um, Indian philosophy is androgyny, where your masculine and your feminine elements of your being are brought to perfect balance. 
whereas the conventional morality says you have to be a man or a woman and these two as you know men are from Mars and women are from Venus and they just are different species altogether and spirituality says you know um, you are genderless and you get a body which is of one gender or another there are two basic possibilities some people get very confused I have a young friend who says you know and he's you know, full beard and very masculine he says you know I really am a woman I said that's okay you, know, you have every right to be that he was telling me yesterday you know I think I've got a woman's voice I said you know you have a nice voice <laughs> I know the difference. Oh, really? <laughs> but, you know, it, it happens. And this is also to do with karma. You've had many births, some female, some male, and sometimes you just don't know which you are. And, and spirituality says you have within yourself all possibilities. But the external says you cannot wear a pink shirt if you're a guy. I saw Louis wearing a pink sweater, that was good. I mean, yeah, but I, I remember when pink shirts first came out in the 1960s and it was so shocking that guys would wear pink. I don't know if you remember back then. <laughs> but, you know, people really started to do things and now we have unisex clothes, unisex hairstyles, unisex blues in public places, whatever, whatever, you know. And then the question of color and people who have mixed colored ancestry, they don't know who they are, you see. So this, this identity of the soul that says you're genderless, colorless, ageless, classless, you know, you're a being, and then you have a performance. So from that angle, there is nothing to say that you have to do something to restrict yourself for moral reasons, or social reasons, or financial reasons, or whatever. So it opens up all possibilities. However, uh, one of the other things that we have to take into consideration enormously, and that is the impact of trauma. Um, there's many, many different forms of trauma. And usually if you're thinking in, in a medical sense, trauma means you have a big accident. And uh, so you go into the trauma ward for putting your bones back together, but uh, other kinds of trauma of when you see something that you shouldn't have to see, or a small child seeing a war going on between their parents, how many people are raised in dysfunctional families due to alcohol abuse, drug abuse, domestic violence, various things and and all of this is something that you have um, no control over so there's just rather large numbers of people who are trauma survivors walking around looking like proper adults but there's all this stuff going on underneath which in many ways drives what a person does and the other thing that is coming to light a great deal is the trauma of child uh, sexual abuse, which can happen as young as infant. And uh, then you get the phenomenon of the dead child, because it is really a, um, a murder of the soul. See, but the soul is indestructible, so to murder an indestructible being, that kind of trauma has a huge, huge impact. 
and when it's very widespread in the society, which it is, uh, then it has a huge social impact. And it's all um, uh, denied. So uh, a lot of the phenomena associated with denial and um, uh, when something like this happens very young, you forget. And so from the subconscious, you are driven by an energy that you have no idea about, which makes you sabotage the self. So self-sabotage is something that is what is meant by you are your own worst enemy. You get almost to an achievement and then you do something to wreck it. Have you experienced that? There are many traumatized people who will do that as a sign of trauma. Um, inability to have close intimate relationships, sign of trauma. Uh, being a workaholic, sign of trauma. How many successful people are so due to being workaholic? So very successful on the outside and inside a basket case. You know? And so this kind of um, almost a schizophrenic existence where you do things to look good, producing something which we call looking good syndrome, Lots of people have that, you know. And so this this is the um, the very well developed ego which can um, uh, anticipate any and every eventuality. So that you know the ego is absolutely not going to get detected and definitely not brought down. But yet, to be your own best friend is to be able to see the falseness within and to transcend it and become completely and totally real. And these messages, like the one I mentioned earlier, don't be selfish, is a very big one that stops a person from fulfilling their potential. And so many people will just hold themselves back in case they might be selfish. Not even, they're not worried about somebody on the outside accusing them, but you've got this internalized, external moral authority voice which will say, no, you can't do that. You can't follow your heart because that would be selfish. But if you don't follow your heart, then you never really lived. So you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. And this is why I think um, to truly be your own best friend, it's very important to take risks. Sometimes at this point I, I play the the song of Bette Midler, The Rose. You all know that one, so I don't need to play it. But uh, it's about love. To be your own best friend, you must love you. And I think that a traumatized child has a very hard time loving themselves because the trauma is interpreted by the child as, I am not lovable. Uh, this happened to me because I deserved it. And that becomes the underlying thrust in life. And there are many people who have this going on and they don't even know that it's to do with some event that was completely beyond their control that doesn't mean anything about themselves but a child is anyway egocentric 
which means whatever happens to me, I made it happen. And I deserved it. Well, they have that logic. And sometimes people who do get traumatized at very early age through any of these things, they remain stuck in that and this then becomes the ego that drives them for the rest of their lives, you see. So um, there is a, a deep connection between a spiritual um, enlightenment and psychological work. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people get interested in the aspects of psychology because of their spiritual needs. And in the wor world of um, professionals, these two areas are absolutely separated. And um, in a way it's an artificial separation. I think a person can only really develop themselves spiritually once they've sorted out their psychological issues. You can start, but then you get to a point where there's a serious block and you can't move forward because you must sort out your psychological issues before you can go on. So your spiritual development can get really arrested at that point. And this can also cause a person to have a, a lot of doubt in the self. Um, because if you start to explore yourself spiritually, you reach these blocks, and you've kind of moved away from the world of materialism, you find yourself in a sort of limbo which is a very, very uncomfortable place to be. And you may start behaving in a really weird way and then you get marginalized. And that is a very tragic thing that happens to a lot of people. So I think that to, to know about these things is important so that you don't do that to anybody. That's a, quite a bad thing to do, but a very commonly done thing. So you have all these marginalized, resentful people floating around. They can be dangerous. Uh, so, the self. How do I uh, be my own really, really best friend? And I think you have to look into your heart and ask yourself this very important question, very difficult question to answer, what do you want? Very difficult question to answer. So, did you do some journaling earlier today? Was it, um, was it good? So I'd like you to really look at this question, what do you want? sit with it, you know, because what we want has lots of layers, and what's really good is to get to the root of what do I want, uh, because then you know what you're going for, and I think it's, it's really important to have an aim and a goal and a thrust, and to really see what is it that makes me really happy. You know, I, I mentioned yesterday, I think it was, that uh, the greatest happiness is when you understand something you didn't understand before. That applies to me, it might not apply to other people. But if you can find that thing that really gives you the greatest happiness, then you know what track you need to be on. So one is to really understand your fears Oh, that's important, but very important to really be clear, what do I want? And of course the first answer is, well I really don't know. And the second answer is, you want what you're supposed to want. You know, get Fall in love, get married, have children, get wealthy, uh, and uh, live happily ever after. Mm. <laughs> that really doesn't do it, you know. Um, so what else do I want? Oh, uh, well, I really, don't know. I really don't know. How do I find out? 
sit in silence with the self, go deep and look at all the things that come up for what do you want. For me, I always ended up with the conclusion that uh, freedom, I must have absolute and total freedom. Any restrictions not okay you know so so people say oh you know it's lonely at the top you know you shouldn't want that why why can you there's not that much room at the top of Mount Everest if you go up there and I, I don't know if you know about going up on top of Mount Everest, but you can only stay there for a maximum of seven minutes, otherwise you will most certainly die. Not very many people know that. You know, you prepare yourself for years and years to go to this summit, the top of the world, and normally people stay there half a minute, because you can't come back down again. So to me, that's a very important symbol that um, maybe some of what you want involves peak experiences. Sometimes people think they sit on the peak and stay there and that's happiness. But no, I think that there are contrasts involved in getting there and coming away from there and getting there again may be a different peak and having a number of peaks that are there in your memory which let you know something about yourself and uh, I think success is not a flat thing so what do you really want and if you can identify it and really do those things that take you there, then you will be right with yourself. You know, earlier I mentioned about the importance of being right with yourself. Because to fail to pursue what you want, and then at the end of your life, you find you've lived somebody else's life or something like this, then you know, there's this regret and I think that that's a very negative experience, regret. So to risk being what you really want. Um, karma is, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? What am I going to think? And everything starts with the thoughts and the thoughts start with a motivation, a feeling, an inner drive. That is the initial expression of myself. So to be my worst enemy is to have doubt in the self. So faith in the self is a very interesting thing to contemplate and that is also something I would encourage you to do, to think about what does it mean for me to have faith in me. And many people are non-conventional. To be a non-conformist means that you are doing something which other people would tell you you're crazy and this and that, but um, having faith in yourself is a characteristic that you find in people who really do things very often which are quite impossible, but they just have faith. I must do this, I have to do this, this is me. and they just do it and uh, others will say wow how extraordinary this is um, unbelievable and so on but um, 
the person who really has faith in themselves, they, they, they are alone. So we have to think about uh, this solitude. They say for yogis that these are people who love solitude. So I would ask yourself to check within your life, do you have enough alone time? Alone time is where you kind of reset yourself and remember who you are because we get so lost in our roles and our activities and our other identities. But alone time carries you back to yourself. And I think um, consolidates your sense of faith in yourself. So a person who has faith in themselves, they follow the voice of conscience and they have a certain knowing about what's important, what the priorities are, and they take into consideration what the rest of the world is doing, but not to the point that it overrides what's your priority. So then this voice, don't be selfish, doesn't really have much importance. Because you can distinguish whether you're being selfish or whether you are honoring yourself. And there are many, many things which are, uh, this word self-honor, I like this word a lot, in the practice of Raj Yoga that we do here, we talk a lot about um, Swaman and Swadharma and Swaraj, this word Swa, which is the first half of the swastika, Swa means self. And uh, the swastika literally means I know who I am. That's what it means. I know who I am, frontwards, backwards, inside and out. And in every which way, I know who I am. Swaraj means independence. I am an independent being. And Swaman means I honor myself. So when you honor yourself, you become an honorable person. So the things that you do are honored by others, respected. And to respect the self, especially when you think about yourself as living with yourself forever, um, this is a very strong thought that says, I cannot do anything that I would regret a million years from now. Because forever is awfully long. You can't really think of forever. But to meditation and solitude and silence um, provokes us to think about my existence forever as me, the individual, over and above this life, this body, this gender, this career, this culture, you know. So we start to really be a good friend to the self, the soul, by pushing the limits of um, the limitations that we accept as, as part of our identity. And so a very important um, attitude to adopt, which I would also encourage you to think about, and that is this um, a sense of self that I am an actor. There's a huge, complex, three-dimensional movie going on, and I'm a performer in it. And I can do what I want. And I can be what I want. So what is that? I see. So this first, what am I? Who am I? What do I want? And then do it. So that doing 
coming from what you really are. That is really the pure karma, which causes us to have all of this punya, this everything gets favorable. And then you become favorable for other people because you're really demonstrating a way. See? This is the way. They talk of the Tao, right? You know about the Tao? This uh, Chinese way. So this is the way. The way to be, the way to go. And it's really very different from what we're used to, because it's all about being. I think in the world we grow up in, we're as good as our last you know, successful business deal or article in the newspaper or whatever. You know. uh, whereas this way is nothing to do with that. It's all to do with um, sort of cultivating the self and blossoming the self and that carries on and when you're in old age which is something people really don't like the idea of because you've got to be tall, thin, tan, blonde beautiful and 25 years old, which only lasts for one year. <laughs> you know. um, but as you get into your 60s and your 70s and your 80s and your 90s, are you still growing? Are you still emerging? Are you still discovering further depths in your being? Because all of this external stuff for a person of this orientation, it all comes from the inside. And then whatever is on the outside, you're interpreting and perceiving according to your sense of self on the inside. So what's going on on the outside is truly sense perception. Everything that you can see and hear and taste and feel, all of it is sense perception. And so our orientation in the materialist consciousness is on the outside of our body. You live on the outside of your body, you live in what you perceive. And silence is one way to come back in and there is a very interesting practice that we can try um, in, our, in our little meditation that we'll do now, uh, which is to be, um, say, 10 centimeters behind your eyes. Somewhere in the middle of your head you're behind your eyes so you can really feel a difference between you and your visual perception. So you can just imagine yourself being in the middle of your head and not only you're 10 centimeters behind your eyes, you're also 10 centimeters in between your two ears. So there's a very clear differentiation between yourself, what you are, and the things that you hear. And by making this differentiation, you can become very selective about what you will take in, because your mind contains your sense perceptions and your eyes see in certain ways you have peripheral vision you have what you're focused on um, and you can decide 
what you're looking at. I think an important part of um, what do I want is what do I choose to take in. One of the very strong uh, components of uh, our culture is to find fault. And we can be PhD in finding what's wrong with something or someone. And we get uh, a lot of credit for that. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And you, it's, it's connected with perfectionism. It has to be perfect. And there's unlimited number of things that you can find fault with. So we find fault with each other. We discuss each other's faults. We increase them, multiply them. And this creates this thing called comparison. And we're either better than or worse than someone. Or someone is better than or worse than me. And we, we tend to identify ourselves in comparison to the people who are better than us and worse than us. So there are some people who want to be the very best of all. These are the Everest Summiteer types. And you can only be the absolute best, like a tennis player or something, until somebody else comes along and challenges you and they become the best. So wanting to be the best is a very temporary thing. Um, in um, What Do You Want? to do with how you look at yourself. One of the problems is self-criticism. Do you do that? The most beautiful people in the world can find something wrong with their bodies. And they do, and it makes them miserable. Everybody else thinks they're absolutely marvelous. And then you find that well, the most beautiful people have been photoshopped anyway. <laughs> so it becomes not real. You see what I mean? So the real is to really appreciate the wonder of me. With the good things and the bad things and all of those things. We're not saying, I like this part about myself, I don't like this part about myself. Like, all of it is essential. And in our relationships with other people, it's very, very important for us to be able to accept the totality of another person. This is who they are, this is what they are, and they have a right to be what they are. And I find a very important little message that we can give to ourselves. If you think about your significant other, do you have a significant other? Yeah. So your significant other, just tell yourself that person has a right to be whatever they are. with all their faults, they have a right to it. And if you go back to this idea of the self as an actor, the actor has a script which you perform. And the character that you perform has good side and bad side. And you cannot perform some other character, you have to perform that character. Actor, that's what they do. They get inside the character and perform that character. So we have to actually create our own character. But we also have to observe our own character because we came in with all kinds of characteristics, some good, some bad, whatever it is. It's very important to tell the self, I have a right to be this way. And there may be many people who criticize you for all sorts of things, you know. 
And it's good to say, now I have a right to be the way you don't want me to be. Are there people in your life who want you to be other than the way you are? Usually the close people. They say, oh, why can't you be more like this or that or the other? And the answer is, because I'm not. That's it. Being your own best friend includes giving yourself the right to be exactly what you are and who you are and how you are. And then cultivating whichever elements you wish to cultivate because you are creating your destiny moment by moment. And your destiny is not something that's laid out that you can't do anything about. You have a destiny, no doubt. So part of your process is to identify it and fulfill it. But you can't fulfill it until all the bits are in place and then you go with it. So sometimes part of the process of uh, your spiritual practice, your silence, is to get all the bits, get them in place, come to terms with the different elements of yourself, especially the traumas. Because these scars on the soul are also um, attributes of your individuality that have a right to be there. And they can easily take the form not of a handicap, but of um, something that gives you a very special facility that other people don't have a special kind of compassion, a special kind of understanding, a special way to be able to handle different aspects of, of life, you know. So, when you deny that, when you don't give yourself the right to be the way you are, um, that is to be your own enemy. So let us go into silence and meditation together. And let's begin with spending a little bit of time 10 centimeters behind the eyes. So during the meditation, if you keep your eyes open and maybe focus on something on the table there, it doesn't really matter what. You're not focusing on the thing, you're just doing the act of focusing on the outside of your body from a place that is behind the eyes, about 10 centimeters, so that you can really feel the difference between yourself and your eyes. and really tell that your body is not you, it is your instrument that you use. So then what is this self that I am? I am the perceiver. can perceive outside things and inside things. You perceive your feelings on the inside. And you select which outside things come inside. When you go deep inside, you differentiate the external reality and then there's an inner reality as well, which is not less real. And the inner world is all your beauty and wonder 
and also your dark side. And you must allow the dark side to be there. It has its place. It's not good, it's not bad, it just is. yourself to feel how good it is simply to be myself. You become free from the events of your personal history. They are just events. think of with this passion. Your deep self is independent of those. Then ask yourself deeply, what do I really, really, really want? Different emotions arise, allow them to come, to persist. and to dissipate. Resistance happens. Wait and it passes. Let yourself go slowly deeper. Gently allow yourself to reconnect with the body, the external world. Let yourself move between the inner world and the outer world with ease.